This week, we welcome to the show the one and only Rosita Avigo. Rosita is a naturopathic surgeon or doctor. Is that right? Would we say physician, doctor? Physician, yeah. definitely not a surgeon. That's true. Not for a naturopathic. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> and a herbalist and a teacher and an author and an activist, all kinds of things. Uh, and also the founder of a uh, like a, a biological institute, the Ischel Tropical Research Foundation. Uh, and uh, Correct. yeah, I'm very, very much looking forward to this conversation, Rosita. So thank you and welcome aboard. Thank you very much, Gordon. I'm a doctor of nupropathy, and uh, that is a um, offshoot of chiropractic from 1907. And our specialty is connective tissue damage and ligamentous damage. It's a uh, very, very akin to chiropractic, but it is not chiropractic. All right, Ooh. so let's begin. Nice one. So the first question we have for first time guests, Rosita, is were you a weird kid? Uh, was I a weird? Actually, I remember very clearly my auntie telling me one day that you're a weird kid and <laughs> no, in exactly those words. I was weird in the sense that uh, I was always fascinated by local plants. I grew up in the city of Chicago, yet few people realize that the city of Chicago is one of the greatest high biodiversity areas of the world because uh, before white men came, it was a, uh, the land of what the native, uh, native people called the land of no sweat because there were so many uh, plants to harvest for food, for medicine, shelter, weaving, mats. There were ducks and geese and birds and deer and turkey. So that's why they called it the land of no sweat. And as for medicinal wild plants, I don't know of any place that I've ever been, truly, that I've ever been that has more biodiversity than the city of Chicago. So in Chicago, in my backyard, I discovered a patch of native wild mint. And that was my uh, first uh, herbal ally and companion throughout my childhood. My mother said that I used to line my dollies up like in hospital beds and then make uh, peppermint pills with mud and stuff their little dolly mouths with uh, mud peppermint pills. So she said, you've always been weird. <laughs> So. Great. See, it's interesting because my sort of follow-up question was going to be, what do you think came first for you, the plants or the healing? But it's they're the same. <laughs> you found the they're the same. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that's I wonderful. would say the plants. Yeah, the plants came first. Cool. So, how did you uh, find your way to the sort of first career, the the, the to become a naturopathic? Uh, physician? How did you find your way to that? Was it a healing journey of your own? Or did you, you know, were you looking for which modalities you resonated with most? It was a natural progression. I uh, was living in uh, Mexico and then Belize in the early uh, 70s. I went home for Christmas to visit my family. My brother was there and he had a terrible backache. And I was able to help him with his backache simply with what I knew to do intuitively. I had not yet taken any, any training in body work and my brother's back got so improved over those short days of a holiday that he and uh, my father got together and decided that I should go back to Chicago. He would, I would live with him and was, I had a baby at the time. My daughter was only about 14 months old as a single mother, and that I could stay with him, study at the College of Nepropathy. Uh, my brother said, you're so good at this, you need to really study this, get a degree, and become a professional. So I went to Chicago, stayed with him, and graduated from the College of Nepropathy with honors in 81, met my husband, Dr. Shropshire, there, and then in 82, we came to live in Belize in Central America. And so you'd been to Belize before, but he hadn't. So what was it about Belize specifically that drew you back there rather than, say, Mexico? It's pretty easy, you know. Um, for me, Belize, because my husband didn't speak Spanish, and so it's an English-speaking country. 
And also I was interested in a year round growing season. I'm a natural food vegetarian. I like organic food. I insist on organic food and uh, people refer to me as fussy. So I said, if I'm that fussy, I should really be growing the food for myself. So that's what I came to do a year round growing season and also to live and practice as doctors of naturopathy in a country where natural healing is not against the law. Where in America in the 70s and the 80s, there was a great push from the authorities that be to uh, to kind of, um, um, what would we say, to harass people involved in natural healing. So uh, we left for that medical freedom, medical freedom, a year round growing season and racial harmony. Belize is a great um, boil up as they call themselves, a mixture of many different cultures together and living in reasonable harmony. So for those three reasons, uh, we chose Belize. Okay. It's funny the, uh, because I'm in New Zealand for a friend's wedding and, and some research and they're looking at, there's some terrifying laws coming through now. So that battle doesn't go away where they're essentially looking to ban um, or default um, unapprove all natural medicines and only have and only kind of like bring them in on an individual approval basis. And given the last few years we've went through, my friends that I meet up with down here are naturally cynical that that law is going to be applied in in a healthy way. It's 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 funny you can't uh, we think we moved past it, but uh, it comes back around again every yeah. time. It keeps, it keeps popping up all, all over the world. And I just felt that all we want to do is help people. We've spent four years of our life getting this degree and I don't want to think that I have to hide or that I have to fear taking care of sick people. So primarily that's why we have thrived and been so happy in Belize. Our garden is thriving. We have lots of organic food and uh, we had a very, very busy, successful napropathic practice for 42 years. I took care of women and children. My husband took care of boys and men. And that's how I became an expert in, um, in uh, women care and especially uh, prenatal, pregnancy, and postpartum care because uh, most of my patients were Mennonite women and they have as many as 18 children in the family. So since I was their primary health care provider, I was able to take care of them from their prenatal days all the way through postpartum. But I am not a midwife and I do not uh, deliver babies. Right. So that's, I mean, a, a career that's that long is quite wonderful in the sense that you would have, yes. even if you didn't deliver babies, you would have had babies that then went on to have babies that would have been clients. Correct. Yeah, that's, that's exactly true. I took women through nine pregnancies and then their babies that I took care of in utero, I also cared for them while they were having babies. Yes, it was a magnificent experience of intergenerational clinical practice. When you, when you arrived in Belize, with these fancy degrees, did you, was there an intention before you met Don Eligio, Don Eligio that you were looking to, let's say, get an extra degree or, or to continue your, your training and education? Was that in the back of your mind when you got to Belize? No, I was only interested in learning medicinal plants. I was very happy to settle into the rest of my life with my degree in naturopathy, but I was not familiar with the local medicinal plants. When I lived in Belize earlier, I was primarily taking care of a newborn and that took up all my time. But when I came back, she was about to enter into first grade and uh, we opened our clinical practice and I have always used body work and herbal remedies as my primary therapies. So I needed to learn about the medicinal plants and I asked contacts and friends and Pretty much uh, everyone gave me the same answer. You have to go see the old man in San Antonio. You have to find Don Eligio. He's the best. He's number one. And then other people said, oh, no, stay away from him. He's a lecher. He's, he's, he's a womanizer. Don't, whatever you do, don't go there. So uh, I didn't listen to the negatives because people often um, 
think negatively about natural healers, especially herbalists. So I didn't pay attention to that. And uh, one day he came to see me. He was looking for his favorite herb, which is called Flor de Tilo or Linden Flower Tea, the Tilia Americana. He had been a widow for the last three years after 65 years of marriage, and he was having a hard time sleeping, and he was hoping that as an American healer living now in his town close to him, close to where he lives, that uh, I would have this plant, and I did. It's also one of my favorites. So he was impressed by that, and uh, I took care of him like any other client, and I said, and your name? And he said, oh, I'm Don Eligio Panti from San Antonio. So I was really nearly dropped my glass jar of herbs. And then uh, he looked at my treatment table and he went, oh, my neck, my neck really hurts. And I said, get on the table. I'll see what I can do for you. So I gave him his first napropathic treatment. And of course, he was hooked. And so our, our relationship lasted for 13 years. And I learned medicinal plants from him, but I had no idea that Don Eligio Ponti was one of the last living Maya shamans on the earth. That was a complete surprise to me. I thought that I had uh, graciously and wonderfully um, been invited by an excellent herbalist to uh, come to visit him, and hopefully that might uh, lead to, uh, to teaching or an apprenticeship. But I did not know that Don Eligio was the last representative of a 5,000-year line of spiritual healers of the Maya people. So once I discovered that, I was uh, extremely concerned that I was inadequate to do what Maya medicine deserved as far as recording, uh, saving, chronicling, archiving. So I contacted uh, different scientists around the world. One answered, and that was Michael Ballack of the New York Botanical Garden in 1983. And he said, oh, how exciting that you actually know a real Maya traditional healer. I would love to come meet you and to meet him. So he was on our doorstep within two weeks, and he was in charge of a program to collect medicinal plants in Central America for cancer and AIDS research in Washington. And so because he had funding from the National Cancer Institute and the United States Congress to conduct this research program, we were able to, to work with 12 different traditional healers, including Don Eligio and these other, other healers, to collect the medicinal plants that they used, record their names, and some of our medicinal plants have as many as eight different names because of the multicultural background of Belize. And then find their Latin names, record their uses, contraindications, stories, and myths, and then also take a herbarium specimen of every plant. So we ended up doing that for 3,000 medicinal plants of Belize. And all of those records are in Belmopan, the capital of Belize, in the forestry department, and the New York Botanical Garden in Bronx. So that's how we were able to uh, record and archive. Yet, that's not the living. Yeah. That's not the living science. That's not the living medicine. So my work with Don Eligio, after a full year of coming to visit him and helping him with his clinical practice, he was extremely busy. Don Eligio had more than 100 clients in a week. When I met him, he was 90. So by then, he was starting to tire, and it, at times it was too much work for him. So he was happy to have an assistant, but he was not uh, eager to train me because he said, you have no sastun. Well, what's a sastun? I never heard that word before. And he said, that's the magical instrument that is used by by the Maya spirits to do divination and, and, and enchantment. Well, this was complete news to me. How, I don't know what a sastun is. Where would I get a sastun? I simply scratched my head and uh, kept uh, coming to visit him every week, helping when I could. I even gave enemas to his female clients. It was a job he didn't relish. 
and collected plants for him, swept the floor, gave him a treatment for his aches and pains every time I came. Finally, a full year goes by, and I'm on his doorstep earlier than usual, because usually I walk across the river on foot, climb through the bush for a mile on foot, and then walk five miles to his village. This day, I had got a ride to his village, so I was there at 6.30 a.m. I'm standing on his doorstep, and he opened his wooden door, and the look that he gave me was, oh, no, she's here again. So I thought, hmm, this is my last day. I'm never coming back. But I said, uh, and he looked at me, and he said, I don't have time for you today. I've got too much work to do. I've had so many patients, I haven't had time to harvest my corn. And the season is getting late. And I said, well, let me help you harvest your corn. And he gave me that look that said, you, what do you know about harvesting corn? You're from Chicago. And I said, Don Eligio, I lived seven years in Mexico. I know how to harvest corn. So he gave me one of those Maya woven baskets that sits on your head. We walked off to the field and it was a 90 minute walk over a very rough road to get to his milpa. So finally we're there and he says, now, now get on your belly and crawl through the bush. And there were 30 feet of high bush so that you couldn't see the cornfield. And he said he did that so people didn't steal the corn. So we're crawling through the bush, literally on our bellies, uh, you know, Rambo style. And when I come out, I can't believe my eyes. Don Eligio's cornfield at 90 years old is a mountainside. And I come out, I stand up and I look up, 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 up. The whole mountainside is covered in beautiful corn and beans and pumpkin. But he grew for his son's family, grandson. The grandson had 11 children. So 13 people in that family, and Don Eligio now a widower by himself, but he grew all the corn, beans, and pumpkin for the whole family. So I began harvesting corn, throwing the cobs into my basket, piling it up. And then around 10 o'clock in the morning, we meet in the middle. And he sees my pile and my full basket, and he looks at that, looks at me, and he said, are you married? <laughs> I said, yes. Yes, Don Eligio, I'm married and I have three children. Oh, he said with that long, oh. And so we finished uh, working that morning and around noon, we're up at the very top of the mountain. And because there's a mountain behind us, the sun is just getting up to that point. And Don Eligio stood up in front of me and the sun rises behind him and there he is in a medallion of sparkling golden light. It was quite magical. And he said, what is it that you want? In Spanish, of course, he didn't speak English. Que es que tu quieres, is what he said. And I answered, Don Elijo, I just want to know about medicinal plants. If you teach me, I promise to be a good student. I promise to take care of you as much as I can and help you with your clients. I, I won't be any trouble. And then he stood up, shook his finger at me and said, do you promise if I take the time to teach you that you will take care of my people when I'm gone? Bless his heart, concerned about others, even from the grave. And I agreed with the big gulp in my throat. And um, from that day forward for the next uh, 12 years, as he said, step by step, day by day, little by little, you will learn and I will teach. So then uh, was the apprenticeship until he passed away at 103 in 1996. Yeah. So it's amazing. Uh, 103 is rather a long innings. Uh, what do we know about the sort of beginning of his life? It's such a fascinating century to be on earth at a time of um, Dramatic change in that in that corner of the world. Uh, it, he was born. Yeah, he was born. Was the one he left. So different. He was born in 1893 in Guatemala, and his father was an infamous necromancer and um, a practicer of evil magic. 
And so he, um, his father got into a lot of trouble when uh, baby Eligio was just a year old. He, um, the authorities in town were actually running him out of town. So he and uh, the father, the mother, and baby Eligio walked from Peten in Guatemala to La Colonia at that time, which was old British Honduras. To the Guatemalans, it was simply the colony, La Colonia. So they walked during the night and hid during the day because the authorities were out looking for his father. And so they settled in the small village close to the border called Sukuts, where um, his mother had a relative. So there he grew up, and um, his father was a violent man. So he had to protect his mother from his father's domestic violence. And at the age of uh, 15, he told me the story of how his father used to come home and beat his mother. And when he reached 15, he said, this is never happening again. So he had his machete ready. And when his father came home in a drunken rage, he threw him to the floor with his knee in his neck and the machete over his face saying, you ever touch my mother again, I swear, father, I will kill you. And that was the last time his mother was ever beaten. So uh, he found his wife in the village where he lives now in San Antonio. He married and went to live there because of his father's reputation. His new bride's father would not let her go to live with him in his household. So he had to go live with her in San Antonio. And that's how he came to live in that village where he lived and worked and passed away for one, like from the age of 15 to 103, whatever, 90 some years of life that he lived there. He was a chiclero uh, in the 1930s. A chiclero is someone who uh, collects the resin of the zapadilla tree. At the time, they were making natural chewing gum all over the world. And one of the primary resources was in Central America, where the chicle trees grow. And that's where Don Eligio met his teacher, Jerónimo Requena. So Jerónimo Requena was the bush doctor at the chicle camp. And he was there to take care of uh, bruises and cuts, uh, injuries from falls and snake bites, common cold, the flu, whatever, whatever the chicleros needed. And it was usually a camp of 50 or 60 men. So Jerónimo was there for that purpose. And Don Eligio was one of the chicleros. And he asked uh, Jerónimo one night if he would teach him about healing. And Jerónimo said, no, you're too young. And I guess Don Eligio was probably 25 at the time. You're too young. You've got too much blood, the way he told me that Jerónimo told him. Tienes mucha sangre. You've got too much blood right now. You're too young. But Eligio, like me, <laughs> continued to go back and insisting and asking, please tell me about the medicinal plants. And then uh, finally, uh, Jerónimo agreed to teach him. So he had uh, one uh, full chicle season, which is about six months with, with his teacher. Then they came out of the high bush for another six months. And then during that time, his teacher uh, died falling from a coconut tree. And Don Eligio was with him when he passed away. And his teacher said, I die a happy man because what I learned, you now know. So that he, that's how he learned in the, uh, in the jungles of, of uh, Guatemala with his teacher. Uh, I've heard written elsewhere or read elsewhere that Don Eligio's tradition is or was, uh, could be described as Yucatecan. Uh, is that, a one, do you think, uh, this is actually a three-part question, is that reasonable uh, or accurate? Uh, it, do we learn anything important, given that we're talking about a tradition that's rather long, with a statement like that? And is that because of Hieronimo's background or because from memory from reading Sestun, uh, Don Eligio, Don Eligio's wife's family actually had, uh, well, he learned some, 
herbal knowledge that came from the Yucatan region from them. But is that, I, I've read that in a couple of places that his was a right. Yucatecan. Well, this is how Don, Don Eligio's uh, tradition is Mopan, Guatemala, and Mexican Yucatec. So it's half true. His teacher actually was a, uh, a Carib Indian, which means that he was a descendant of an African slave here in, in um, Central America, in old British Honduras before it became Belize. So his teacher was, was an African Caribbean. His uh, own tradition was Guatemala. And he had, uh, in the later years, he had a uh, Mexican teacher who was living in the village as a herbalist, Don Manuel Sid, who lived to be 115. He was one of the original founders of the Yucatec Maya, who came down from, from that area of Mexico during the Guerra de las Castas, the last uprising of the Mexican Indians against the Spaniards in 1910. So thousands of people left Mexico and came to British Honduras seeking refuge from, from the war. And his whole band of Mexicans ended up in Western Belize in what is now San Antonio. But they founded that village when they uh, first got to that area in 1910, there were still natives using bow and arrows, hiding in the hills, in the caves. So it was a uh, extremely primitive area when Don Eligio's teacher started living there in 1910. So he had several years with Don Manuel of the Yucatec Mexican tradition. He had that Carib mix and he had the Guatemalan. So like a true Belizean, we call it, you know, uh, Belizeans call themselves boil up, which means that there are many different things that go into the pot to make up a Belizean. So, so I, I think one of the things, that, you know, I think one of the things that interests me about that is I was in Merida last year and talking to some people in a, talking to some curanderos uh, when I was there, my understanding, and it, we, we kind of know this when we look at the Mayan calendar, is that the in the area, the lineage is broken and has been for about 100 years. Uh, and it, and that, that times with uh, Don Eligio's teachers leaving and ending up in Belize, right? So I just, I look at it as a, is there, what would it take? Or is there any interest in almost like bringing that back? Do you know what I mean? Into a Yucatecan, if there's a Yucatecan lineage that, survived in in western belize it just seems to me i, I don't know I'm, I'm 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 really tantalized by that idea i guess yeah i i understand that uh, the concept uh, i know from my time in yucatan i've spent quite a bit of time there in actual fact the healing traditions manage to survive okay, good. there are a few um shamans left um not many, and I believe by now most of them are deceased, like here, they're all deceased here in Belize. I, I'm not positive. I haven't spent a lot of time in Yucatan. I've been a regular visitor up there, but from my experience there and talking to other people, I actually don't believe that the healing traditions are dormant there. I find that the midwifery is very strong. The herbal remedies are strong, and I think that it's been a worldwide surge of a renewed interest in natural healing and medicinal plants. And of course, it made its way to those remote areas of the third world, Mexico uh, included, because for one reason, they're of the uh, resorts all up and down the coast, and the uh, tourists go there seeking information about plants, about their Maya abdominal massage, and about the spiritual healing. And so they realize, wow, somebody's interested in this. It's not just our old folks. I, I just, I don't really see that the Yucatec um, tradition of natural healing is is uh, dormant it's not been my experience okay that that's really that's really encouraging because one of the things yeah, that's good news in yes. australia yeah it's great it's great so here's a roundabout question so you you, you essentially apprenticed to donnelly here for a year before he decided with that corn story and, and the rest of it okay you're 
part of you're now part of my transmission of this knowledge so that it survives after my death was there one do you think that was his plan all along (laughs) is the first part of the question and two what did that look like in his head i'll tell you i have an example from australia there was he's dead now as well a a gagaju elder um, by the name of bill meiji and he had a very similar life in many respects to don alicio he lived quite a long time and was a a pearl diver for the colonies, you know, the the sort of North Australian living uh, for indigenous men. He grew up, he was born in the wilds and lived his life half in the wilds and then half his civilization, so-called, showed up. And towards the end of his life, he was aware that the young people were not interested in the native traditions. And he was a wisdom teacher. teacher. He had this knowledge that he was obliged to pass on. And so he found a white photographer in the National Park who was interested, and they collaborated on a number of books. Uh, And towards the end of them, what um, old Bill was saying was that I'm putting this stuff in the books for a time when my young people are actually interested in it so that it can be picked back up. Was there, I I guess what I'd like to hear is the, I'm so excited to hear that there's still Yucatec and um, traditional healing going on. What's your... What was his plan and, and how are things going? How are things going with like the state of, of these healing traditions? As you say, all the um, elder shaman are, are dying out and so on. Where, where are we at with that? Well, I remember um, Don Eligio saying uh, in the er- very early days during that first year that it would do no good to teach a gringa, meaning a, a foreigner, an American woman. But towards the end, he realized at the age of 90, as he said to me, these are not my words, these are his very words, that where is the person who will sacrifice to learn this great art? This art is a sacrifice because it's hard work. People mistrust healers. They more, even more mistrust spiritual healers. And in the middle of the night, after you've worked all day long, someone comes knocking on your door at 2 a.m. with the sick baby. And there's very little um, income because people are poor. So basically, where is the person who will open their heart and make the sacrifice for this work? Yet there I was every single week for a full year. And I believe he felt it was better to teach someone than to take what he said, his lamp to the grave. He um, regretted the thought that he would take all of his wisdom and knowledge to the grave with him. So better to teach someone than to teach no one. Eventually, a few people from his village did step forward, and there are people in the village now doing uh, some of Don Eligio's work. So that also happened because of, I don't know exactly if it was my presence there that stimulated people. I, I don't know what was in their minds. I guess they realized now Don Eligio's 98, 95, we should do what we can to capture this before it really is too late. I don't know that that was Don Eligio's plan. I know that he said he was very happy to have a woman apprentice. He said um, a man's life without a woman in his life is half of nothing. So just to have a uh, female companion walking with him in the bush was very important. The first day that we went together collecting plants in the mountain behind his village, he found the largest uh, skunk root, which is one of his most important medicines. That's the uh, Zorillo. Found the most, the largest one he'd ever found in 50 years of collecting on the same hillside. And he said, That's because you're here. Ischel smiles on, on the male herbalist if he's in the forest with the woman. And that was the first time I ever heard the name of the Maya goddess of healing, Ischel. And I said, Who's Ischel? And he said, Oh, she's the Maya goddess of medicine, the plants, healing. And she looks after us and she helps us find our plants. So from there, I started a um, 15 year research project on East Chell. And um, I think that I've done uh, quite a lot to bring her back to modern life. Many people now love her 
and uh, consider her as a uh, hierarchy of um, healing goddesses. And she's our very own American goddess. That was one of my favorite aspects of working with Don Eligio is that he introduced me to the Maya goddess Ish Chel. Ish means revered woman, sacred lady, and Chel is rainbow. So goddess rainbow basically was her name. Oh, wonderful. You've actually, I'm interested in, because this is all almost like the work of Ish Chel, right? Uh, it's not just learning from Don Eligio and, and, and sharing where appropriate the stuff you learn from him. You've been involved in multiple projects to do with the preservation of uh, and recording projects and anthropology, really, of, of different uh, healers in the Belize area and different plants and, and so on. And I think that's... Is that a preservation in the face of change or, or can we be more optimistic that actually now this is uh, information and resources that is available for that continued growth and flourishing? So what is, what is Belize like now in terms of interest in this kind of stuff? Well, um, I wrote 11 books and my purpose in writing the books was to make it available, put it right into the hands of a, a mother or an auntie or someone who is sick and doesn't know what to do for themselves. So the uh, Rainforest Remedies, 100 Healing Herbs of Belize, I worked on with Michael Ballack of the New York Botanical Garden. That was part of the contract with the National Cancer Institute that they would give us funds to produce a book for the common person. Not a scientific uh, book, but something that householders could use, somewhat something that students interested in learning about medicinal plants could use. It's now in English and in Spanish. And then the uh, Rainforest Home Remedies is the book. It's a compilation of the many different herbal therapies from household plants, like what you might find in the kitchen cabinet, oregano, sage, and um, basil, and uh, rosemary, ginger, cinnamon, garlic, lemon, lime, all those common things that we find around the household, how they can be used for a plethora of common household ailments. It's basically household remedies for household ailments. That, that is available. I wrote a book on uh, Don Eligio's uh, practice of spiritual bathing. That really uh, impressed me the most. There were, I would say, two things that I really um, took away from Don Eligio besides, of course, meant much. But two things that impressed me the most that I thought were so vital to bring back to the world was his spiritual healing with prayers, water, and plants. And then as well, the Maya abdominal massage, which was so wonderful for painful periods, for fertility problems, and for digestive issues. So I teach worldwide now the Maya abdominal therapy. We've trained thousands of practitioners in these very, very valuable ancient massage techniques. And we've been able to help countless number of people with digestive problems and reproductive issues as well. And then the spiritual healing, I think, is something that is ever more relevant day by day in the world that we find ourselves living in right now because of um, national traumas like being experienced at this moment in uh, Turkey yeah. because of the uh, two tremendous earthquakes, the people coming home from the wars all over the planet have what is known here as susto. Susto is fright or trauma. And uh, that is a specific delineation of a spiritual disease in the Maya system. So that involves treating people with prayers, plants, water, and herbal baths. And the results are absolutely astoundingly, dramatically effective. So I treasure what Don Eligio taught me about that and treasure that myself and the students that I trained in that are able to help thousands of people all over the world seeking 
seeking relief from the results of traumatic situations. It's basically post-traumatic stress disorder, which is devastating. I think by now we're worldwide, we're all aware of the long-term effects of PTSD. And John DeLigio gave us a very, very effective treatment plan for that. That is about, again, like the abdominal massage, about 5,000 years old. Yeah. What, what I really sit with when I you know, read the books and think about it is it's almost like the, see how you feel about this. The two most important things when it comes to plant medicine that, we, that I learned from reading your books anyway, uh, from Don Eligio, and when it comes to Susto and Evil Eye and the rest of it, the two things are when it comes to plant medicine, and I love this, uh, he would say that you, know, you, you must pray when you are harvesting the plant or else the spirit won't follow you home. Uh, and, and so there's that awareness of the plants as beings, and in fact that they they effectively won't work <laughs> if we don't if we don't do that. Although you can't say that when you harvest them, of course. Uh, and we have completely divorced that. We've gone chasing molecules in 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 Western herbalism, yeah. and which is fine to some extent, but we the the majority of the e efficacy we've just excised from from the practice and similarly when it comes to healing and i don't even I'm, my father's a psychiatrist so it's not uh, I, i'm not anti mental health and I'm, uh, the rest of it but when when we in the west talk about something that's called mental health we've sort of excised again in many respects the majority of it the the spirit component <laughs> as well and it's just it's sort of fascinating to sit with isn't it Yes, it's very fascinating uh, to sit with the fact that, I mean, I've taken care of uh, people with Don Eligio's spiritual healing system that have been to psychotherapy for 25 years. And I can recall several people who had been in psychotherapy that long and still did not have emotional relief. The, uh, the workings of um, the plant collection for spiritual healing most definitely involves giving thanks to the spirit of the plant. And what I teach my students is that when we stand in front of the plant before we collect it to do a spiritual bath, in fact, I've got one sitting right there for a client I'm going to see this afternoon, we stand before the plant for just a moment to give it the sense that we're there, we're in its auric field, and then take a moment to say, I recognize you as a spiritual being in a physical body, just like me. And Don Eligio taught us to say, I give thanks to the spirit of this plant, and I have faith with all my heart in your great healing power. And in that way, we are able to welcome the spiritual vital force of the plant besides the combination of molecules and active principles. And um, yeah, it is quite, uh, quite astounding how human beings and plants interact in that way. And it truly does feel as though a plant spirit is in the room when you're working on that. And I, I've had a number of dream visions the time that I was with Don Eligio explaining to me how the uh, plant spirits work. For instance, the very, very first day that I went to his clinic as an official, officially accepted apprentice was one of the most harrowing, difficult cases of spiritual healing I ever saw. Yet no, nothing was ever as bad as that. And it was actually a warning, I think, from the Maya spirit saying, look, if you really want to do this, this is what it's going to involve. This woman came from Guatemala. Don Eligio said she was possessed by the devil. Wow. I thought, the devil, I didn't sign up for this. I'm only interested in medicinal plants. I'm not interested in any of, I don't know anything about that. So it was kind of scary. And uh, I managed to, to get through the day. The woman looked quite mad. Probably she would have been institutionalized had Don Eligio not intervened, had his, their, her family not thought that this must be a spiritual disease and brought her 
to Don Eligio. He said the Maya prayers for her. He gave her a spiritual bath. He burned copal, and he gave her a mixture of rue with uh, holy water from the Catholic Church. And uh, the, the uh, response in her was gradual, but slow, but very, very positive. Towards the end, she was healed. But when I stood next to her, the hair on the back of my neck just stood up and did that. Uh, and that night, I was laying in the hammock. I had agreed I would spend three nights there, and it was the very first week. And I thought to myself, hmm, is this really what I want to do? The devil? possessed by the devil? How could it be? And then I thought to myself, you know, I'm here to learn. I'm not here to judge. And really, Don Eligio is a magnificent, sweet, tender human being. And why should I have fear? So I went to sleep that night in the hammock. And in the dream, I saw myself kind of crunched up and wrinkled like this, worrying. And suddenly, a dream vision appears in which there are four angels that surround me. The angel on one side I know to be the angel of Kopal. I could tell by the shimmering colors coming from the field of the angel. On this side was the guardian, was the angel, the plant spirit of Rue. And on, at my feet was one of the plants that he used in her herbal bath. And behind me was St. Michael. And these spiritual beings were like 15 feet tall with blazing auras of sparkling light about 12 feet in diameter. So there I was completely surrounded with these plant spirits. And I never feared again. So Wonderful. that the... Yeah, the aspect of spiritual healing of the ancient Maya is so deep and it's so powerful. It's so magnificently tender in its healing effects. And I use it all the time. That's so wonderful. That, like, that really impressed me incredibly. That first of all, that those plant spirits would show up for me, a, a gringa from Chicago, there learning from this great Maya shaman. But they did. And the message was clear. We're here. If you're willing, if you can be strong and stalwart, we'll be here to protect you. And it's always been that way. Wonderful. Operating from a understanding that plants have and are spirits, I think brings us, I'm very interested as a permaculturalist myself in, I'm very cynical of invasion biology. Uh, and, and what I find is that indigenous healing customs tend to have a more nuanced view of, let's say, introduced plants because rue, rosemary, orange, a, a lot of the plants that are used in, you know, Mayan healing um, are introduced. And in fact, introduced by colonizers in, in some cases. But this, it's, there's, there's a more nuanced understanding of, of plant spirits and particularly when you encounter the beings, like the actual angels of them, like the, the spirits inside of it. And I, I just wonder how, how that fits with, you know, a more, I guess, New York Botanical Gardens view of plants in their, in their right place. Does that make sense? No. Can you rephrase it? <laughs> sure, Sorry. Just like, so rosemary is used regularly in, in uh, you know, uh, Mayan healing situations, right? It's, it, at least to my understanding. And rosemary- Do you mean, how does it, how do those, the, those, those plants that, grow, plants. that came yeah. from the colonists, the introduced? Well, I'm not sure how that they were able to, you know, we were talking about 500 years ago. I don't actually know. But uh, for instance, in uh, Don Eligio's practice, he knew about rosemary, but he never used it because, well, we don't have it here. It was not available. But the oregano, we have a local oregano and we have a Spanish oregano that came with the Spaniards. We have local roses and we have roses that came with the Spaniards as well. But there were thousands of plants already here when the Spaniards arrived. And I think that many of the friars that came here were healers. We must never forget that, that they came from, from monasteries where people went to seek healing. 
they went for whatever system they used then, but they could only have used medicinal plants. There was no modern medicine as we know it today. So many of the friars brought those plants and they brought their healing traditions with the plants. And people who love plants, people who are interested in healing, can't wait to sit at someone's feet and learn about another plant from another country and how they might use it. I find that as far as the colonialism goes, that was probably the softest of all the intrusions were the plants that the Spaniards brought. They seem to have harmonized beautifully with the locals here. I never feel any sense of um, anger from them, and I feel like they they came to be a blessing yeah. to the people, and I believe that's how local people see them. I never heard a single traditional healer decry a medicinal plant because it originally came from Spain. See, that's that's where I was getting at. Where we don't uh, there's a I think a more nuanced understanding. Uh, there's a anthropologist Wolf Dieter Stahl who was studying with Navajo from memory. And on one, in, in the 70s, in one of his walks um, with a Navajo uh, medicine man, he sort of said, oh, look at that introduced species and, and like, as if it was a weed. And his mm-hmm. medicine man teacher was like, no, 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 just leave that. We, this is a new nation that showed up and we're not sure what business we have with each other yet. And that right. is better. <laughs> I think that's actually literally a better way of understanding and that's that's, I think that's what right. I was getting at. There's like a there's a more when you understand that plants are spirits and they have agency, you're less quick to kind of go. Well, you're not from here, so we're not going to use you. You're you're, you're kind of waiting uh, for that that yeah. sort of engagement. And that's such a waste. Yeah, it's such a waste of of the vital qualities of a plant like Spanish oregano or rosemary. Uh, and they have so much to offer, and they're they're the innocents in the exactly. conquest. <laughs> exactly. And if there if there was any benefit, the plants that the Spaniards brought was definitely one of the benefits. So returning to the sastun, uh, always a trick question, but not really. Do do the spirits speak? through the sestoon or do they speak to someone in possession of a sestoon right because there's there's the dream encounters and and all the rest of it as well how it because it's reading and sitting with your descriptions of them and your experiences of the sestoon i'm like it's not in in western traditions we have scrying crystals so john d would talk to angels through something that was about that big and um, but the uh, one an angel actually handed him through a first uh, floor window so we have this idea of we have an experience of, of crystals being used to scry. Uh, and, and you can with the sestu and you can divine with it. But it just seems like it's, it's more, it's bigger than that. That it, what, a, a possession of a sestu is an indication that the Maya spirits are like, okay, cool, you're on the team. <laughs> We're going to talk to you. Yeah. Is that closer? I think so. I think they speak through. Mm-hmm through the Sastun. Uh, when Don Eligio did his Sastun readings, um, which was Sakar Su Suerte, pull out your luck, is how it's locally termed here. People would come and say, quiero sacar mi suerte. I want to check my luck. And so then Don Eligio put his little um, crystal into a clay jar and he would twirl it around and twirl it around on the table in circles while he did a Maya chant, asking the Sastun for the answer that he was seeking for this person. And it was always nine times. It had to be said nine times. And even those two words, nine times, nine times, nueve veces, nueve veces, was part of the, the, uh, the chant to call the Maya spirits to give their answer through the medium of the of the lines and bubbles in this glass crystal crystal object. It was a crystal ball, but it was no really his was no bigger than a child's marble. But I believe that the Maya spirits speak through through the Sastun and that they with the chant they are called in into the setting. And they are then uh, able to affect the way the lines and the bubbles congregate within the sastun. And then Don Eligio puts it in the hand, 
put it in the hand of the supplicant and they would shake it like dice. And then he would take it to the front door and then he would read the Sastun. But um, yeah, I feel that they speak through the Sastun. Cool. All right. It's my take. One of the one of the things that he, he mentions in the book or that you mentioned that he says in the book is that there was a over the second half of the 20th century, a tremendous growth in Maldad and black magic as a result of uh, American publishing imports of those kind of things, you know, grimoires and, and the rest. Uh, is, that, is that still in play or has that kind of diminished as people, dare I say, secularize more? Or, or is that in your experience in the intervening several decades since he's passed? Is, is there still a high you mean degree of black, black magic? Do you mean, yes, there is still black magic, yes. It's not as much as it used to be, but it is still there. I, I still have people come to me and telling me that they've been enchanted. When someone says that they've been enchanted or that they've had something thrown at them, it's called being thrown, something thrown at you, signifies that they have been the victims of some kind of evil spell, which is like as a result of envy, jealousy, anger, and resentment. All of those common human negative emotions in some parts of the world and some cultures, like in Central America, they use um, black magic as means of revenge. And there's all it's always the case. It's jealousy, resentment, or anger. So somebody got really jealous or really angry with the neighbor or somebody, maybe a lover, and um, they go to see someone who is a specialist in that, like Don Eligio's father, pay them to cast a spell or to bring evil fortune and bad luck into a person's life. And we might laugh at it and think it really couldn't be, yeah. but it is. It yeah. can be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as Don Eligio explained that there are benevolent spirits and there are malevolent spirits. The malevolent spirits still work in the same realm and what the purpose of this evil is, that it should belong to a body of spirits, I don't know. I don't understand. But I do know that, yes, it's still uh, prevalent. <coughs> Excuse me. But not as much as it was in 20 years ago. It seems to be maybe it's on a, it's on a down low right now. It uh, Hopefully it doesn't come back, but it's still around, yes. Do you think it, the... The decline in the use of black magic is just because younger people are less aware of these spiritual realities because of a modernizing beliefs. You know, I can't, I actually don't know. Uh, I believe that um, I not, don't know for sure that it is less or more because I no longer am open True. to that sort of thing. I believe there are people in other parts of Belize I know who are open to treating that, and I think that they're pretty busy, but I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah. I should just be honest and say I don't know. Sure. Final question, or I guess observation, that I found fascinating uh, on the reread of Sestun, because I actually, my mother bought the book when it came out, and so we ended up having to buy it again. I was back up there for Christmas. And we couldn't find it in her bookshelf. So I ended up buying a, a second copy. And the way these magical books vanish, that's how it always goes. Uh, yes. And one of the things on the reread that I noticed, Don Alihio was aware of something that's really only been kind of, I would say, medically definitive in the last eight years, that it was packaged food that was at the heart of uh, Western illnesses. We've at the time, if you're talking like you know 80s and 90s, people thought wrongly that it was fat, uh, and it was packaged food. It's the seed oils. It's the you know it's the modified wheat flour, anything that's in the package, and the preservatives that are of course you know messing with the microbiome. It's just really fascinating that uh, he completely nailed in this one sentence exactly what is at the root of the overwhelming majority of, of Western disease being this essentially non-fresh food, right? Like uh, packaged food. I think yes. that was quite amazing. Yeah, quite amazing that he was astute to see that. However, he was born in 1893 
He uh, was growing up as a teenager around the uh, turn of the century and lived through the 20s, 30s, 40s, and the white bread only came into existence in 1941. That's the year I was born. That's why I know that. And until the 40s, 50s, it really got to be serious when they discovered the chemicals they could use as preservatives and colorants, and then they and then plastic from the 50s where you could wrap things in plastic. Therefore, you could make foods that could last on the shelf for 20 years with the combination of plastic wrapping and preservatives and colorings, flavor enhancers. And so he was aware that his practice changed dramatically after the 1940s. And he believes it was from two things, the packaged food and the refrigerations. Yeah. Refriger refrigeration, because until refrigeration, people did not drink cold things, or eat or drink cold foods. And he feels that especially in the tropics where it's so hot on the outside and you bring introduce ice, cold food and drinks into your system that is already at about 98 or 99 degrees and you're eating things that are at whatever, imagine what an ice cold drink is, that <clears throat> it causes stomach spasms and that causes the the big cause of the of the digestive problems and yeah and then all of the hidden additives in the packaged foods that you know you don't really you don't actually we can't track it through the body but we know we know what it's doing we know the harmful effects that it's having and um yet we keep at it yeah. It's so. amazing. I just it, I, that that context helped so that he had actually had an entire career. He was, so what would he have been then? So he was in his fifties when white bread showed up. Uh, That's right. So That's right. you know, basically half his life before white bread showed up, and obviously practicing for decades by that point, which means yeah, he would, have, he would have seen the change in his practice as people got exposed to what are plainly we understand now toxins. That's I just think that's. It's so wise it, and for him to be like, oh yeah, it's just this. And literally 30 years later, that's, it's completely correct. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yes, yeah. completely correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, with a healing career that lasted um, 60 or 70 years, there's no doubt that you can see patterns of change and shifts yeah. in the clients that you see. Well, Rosita, this was a fascinating uh, conversation. I absolutely loved it. I had, yeah. it's, it, amongst other things, I hope, I mean, people are going to enjoy hearing your amazing life and amazing stories anyway, but I also got to ask some questions that had always been, well, I wonder what that is. So on a personal level, right. I had a great time <laughs> um, having you. a conversation with you. Uh, for people who want to know more about yourself and, and what you've got going on, where can they, where can they find out more? Well, I, I have a website, www rositaarvigo.com and for teaching and classes it's uh, abdominaltherapycollective.com that is the organization under which i teach there is an Ar arvigo institute i no longer teach with them uh, my i am teaching and people that i train are teaching with the abdominal therapy collective and all of the offerings are there the books are on my website and um now there are 11 different books on the um, concepts of natural healing in Central in Central America. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. It was a fantastic- I enjoyed time. it. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Gordon.